Hey folks, welcome to our second video for this module on barriers and conflict in interprofessional education and practice. In our previous video, um, Angus McMurtry talked about two schools of thoughts for looking at professional knowledge differences um, in interprofessional and interdisciplinary work. And in this video, I'm going to be exploring some factors that can influence interprofessional teamwork, which can act as barriers for effective interprofessional teamwork and education. Many of these factors were raised in our readings this week, and some of them weren't. Uh, so I'm going to be introducing a framework here for exploring factors that can affect interprofessional teamwork, as well as sharing a workshop you can do in the workplace that uses this framework. In this video, we're also going to discuss interprofessional conflict with an emphasis on how to approach conflict as educators. So let's dive in. So let's start off by discussing what conflict is. So conflict refers to a struggle or contest between people with opposing needs, ideas, or values, or goals. And conflict, of course, isn't limited to just interprofessional groups. Uh, for example, it can also occur intraprofessionally, so within your own professional group. Uh, for example, horizontal violence in nursing, or with medicine, um, medical students and medical residents may not speak up when they see a supervisor making an error, fearing that saying something could negatively impact their career. And one of our focus readings this week highlighted how health science students, including medicine, nursing, and social work, can experience increased conflict within their own professions. Conflict can also occur between healthcare professionals and patients, and healthcare professionals and management. Uh, so this certainly isn't limited to just interprofessional work. And some degree of conflict is inevitable, and conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the important piece here is how we handle it. And in fact, an absence of conflict itself really isn't a good thing. Without any conflict or friction, a team can fall into groupthink, where there's a lack of debate and critical discussion on a team. So instead of seeking opposing views or different possibilities to address an issue, the team becomes focused solely on just reaching an agreement. So the framework I wanted to share with you today is called the PROC framework. And there are other frameworks that you can look at in this area and ones that specifically look at conflict. And while these other frameworks can be helpful, I find that the PROC framework in particular can be quite useful here as it takes a very comprehensive look at some of the different factors that can impact interprofessional teams. And understanding these different factors and barriers um, can be really important to understand why conflict is arising. And the PROC framework was developed by Dr. Scott Reeves, who was a social scientist and an absolute legend in the um, interprofessional education and collaboration world. And I was fortunate enough to get to work with him early in my career. Um, so it's a framework that is coming from social sciences. And I decided this week to talk about it rather than assigning it as a reading. Um, I found it to be a very useful way actually of organizing all the different ideas I wanted to discuss in this presentation and connecting ideas across the various readings we had this week. Um, and it also contains a few ideas that weren't present in our readings this week. Um, so there's going to be a few bonuses for you today. So the PROC framework considers a wide range of issues that can impact care delivery, which is organized into four domains in the framework. Processual, relational, organizational, and contextual. And the various factors within each of the domains can impact interprofessional work, for better or for worse. And the framework is, of course, like any model or framework, a simplification. So in practice, these domains aren't as clear cut and there can be considerable overlap. Um, but it is a helpful model regardless to help us conceptualize various factors that could be affecting interprofessional practice, which then has implications for our discussion on barriers and conflict in interprofessional education and practice. Uh, so let's talk about each of these domains. So processual. Processual includes factors that affect how the team carries out their work across different workplace situations. Uh, so one of the factors under this is time and space, which are both linked to social organization of work. And we'll start with space here because that's one of my favorite topics to discuss. So within healthcare, the actual physical spatial boundaries have traditionally separated health and social care professionals from each other. Uh, for example, our reading by Pippa Hall highlighted how um, where each school is actually physically located on a campus can limit our opportunities for interprofessional interactions. I'll also add that sometimes different professions can have different physical spaces that isolate staff from each other. For example, separate lounges for physicians and nurses in a hospital. And this limits how much the different professions can interact and learn from each other within the workplace, uh, which I would argue also has implications for role modeling, positive interprofessional collaboration to learners. So it's important to have team spaces where the interprofessional team can regularly come together and interact. And time also needs to be considered, such as giving interprofessional teams more time together so they can develop mutual understandings and trust. Uh, this can include formal team building activities as well as informal social events like birthdays and baby showers. Um, however, different demands on health and social care as professionals' time can make this difficult. Uh, for example, different professionals may be in different parts of the hospital at different times of the day. The next processual factor is routines. And routines are standardized actions or procedures that we regularly follow. 
And over time, they can turn into rituals, wherein they become performances that both enact and institutionalize culturally constructed activities. Uh, so, for example, regular team meetings can be more so performances of interprofessional teamwork rather than actual collaboration. And many professionals may not attend, and few important um, decisions or actual collaboration may occur in these meetings. So it's more so about the performance of teamwork rather than actual teamwork. Um, another example in this area can be rounds. Uh, so, for example, rounds that are more geared towards medical teaching may have limited opportunities for interprofessional interactions. Information technology is another processual factor, and technology can be fantastic because it can allow us to communicate synchronously or asynchronously from different locations, which is great um, when we have time and space factors at play. A con is, of course, that people will have differing levels of digital literacy, and we can lose that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, for example, physicians using workstations on wheels during rounds can affect face-to-face -face communication needs with other professionals. Unpredictability. So interprofessional teamwork is crucial, yet very challenging in unpredictable environments. Uh, for example, emergency rooms, ICUs, operating rooms, um, settings like that. The kind of interprofessional care that a patient requires can also be unpredictable in severely ill patients. Uh, for example, maybe initially upon coming into the hospital, a patient really only needed input from medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. But later, we found that they also required extensive care from occupational therapy, physiotherapy, social work, um, medical radiation technology, etc. And the level of urgency can also necessitate, but once again challenge, interprofessional teamwork. Uh, so teams may work more closely together in high urgency situations, for example, running a code blue. Um, however, during these interactions, team members can also sometimes be more terse or more abrupt in their communication, and this can potentially impact perceptions of collaboration and collaborative work after the fact. Patient care is also incredibly complex. We have increasingly specialized care to meet these complex needs, and there is a need to alter our traditional patterns of care to accommodate the evolving nature of providing specialized care to patients. And I think this ties in nicely with Angus's talk about how different perceptions will have different perspectives and concerns based on their phenomenon of study. For example, in a highly complex case, a respiratory therapist and a physician might have different uh, perspectives on the patient's care plan. And increased specialization also means increased time in our own professional silos, which I think the reading by Hall also mentioned this week. And then finally, task shifting, which is also sometimes called delegation. And this is when one profession hands over tasks to another profession. Um, this is also linked to the creation of relatively newer roles within our healthcare system, like nurse practitioners and physician assistants. This can reduce workloads and it can provide for more flexibility in how we deliver healthcare services. However, adding a new profession to a team can be seen as threatening established scopes of practice and roles. Uh, for example, physicians fearing that nurse practitioners will see simpler cases and leaving them with only very complex cases and higher burden relational factors. So relational includes factors that affect relationships shared by professionals. Um, so the first three here that I'm going to talk about, uh, professional power, hierarchy, and socialization, were covered in my video on social science perspectives in IPE in our previous module. Uh, so I'm not going to go really in depth here on the related theories, so do th watch that video if you haven't already. So professional power is concerned with professionalization and power, as we discussed in our previous module. Within healthcare, medicine holds the dominant position, and it holds a considerable influence on policymaking, the care delivery process, and collaboration. Um, arguably, engaging in interprofessional teamwork and education relies on a willingness to share this power. An IPE can be interpreted as a threat to professional power in medicine's dominant position within the healthcare hierarchy. So medicine as a profession may be potentially disengaged from IPE, or it's possible that they could appear supportive while internally restructuring itself as the dominant healthcare profession through its own body of literature. Resistance to power can also occur on interprofessional teams. Uh, for example, passive resistance, like being apathetic towards collaborating, or active resistance, like someone actually full-on sabotaging a shared project. And I'm sure power imbalances is something that many of you are familiar with, because it is something that we have to navigate regularly within healthcare. Um, a good example would be a physician's decision to discharge a patient, and that may be in tension with the nurse's perspective that the patient is not suitable for discharge at this time. Hierarchy, or perceived hierarchy at least, uh, can certainly be a substantial factor influencing interprofessional work. With regard to conflict specifically, those who are lower in hierarchy may not speak up when conflict arises. For example, students may find it difficult to speak up to someone who is of a higher status, uh, for example, faculty members, staff, uh, senior trainees, administrators, management, etc. Um, even if the conflict is focused on optimizing care, it's also important to remember that students are highly dependent on their academic evaluations, 
which can also act as a barrier for them speaking up. Another example is nurses potentially being uncomfortable questioning a, um, a medical decision that's been made by a physician. And then there's also the factor of socialization, which we also talked about very extensively in our last module. Uh, but in short, professional training teaches health and social care professionals the attitudes that are expected to play the role of their profession well. And this is part of your identity development as your profession. When talking about socialization, our article this week by Cynthia Whitehead also brought up the idea of hidden curriculum, uh, which is something I want to elaborate a little bit on here for you. So from a sociological perspective, there are three types of curriculum, formal, informal, and hidden. So formal curriculum is what's formally in the curriculum, and it's what we're supposed to be teaching. Um, so it's the actually endorsed curriculum. And this is largely what's taught in our classrooms. For example, what is taught in anatomy and physiology lectures. Informal curriculum is the more opportunistic, unscripted teaching that occurs. Uh, for example, informal teaching you may receive in practicum placements. And this is learning that occurs outside of formally designated learning spaces like staff rooms, hallways, uh, med room, places like that. And then hidden curriculum, the third type, is the unintentional and often unarticulated learning that socializes learners into a culture. For example, medical school has a socializing function. It teaches medical students the attitudes and behaviors that are supposedly required to play the role of a doctor well. And these practices and structures can inadvertently contribute to maintaining inequities in our society. And the formal and informal curriculum also have social and economic values embedded in them because these are the official discourses that are defined by the dominating class. Uh, so it will serve learners from that social class well, for example, uh, but it can preserve inequities between classes and preserve stratification within society. And hidden curriculum makes the inequality and ideological hegemony of the dominant class seem natural. In other words, schools give legitimacy to certain types of knowledge, which makes the knowledge of the dominant culture seem neutral. And within an IPE context, this is significant because we can be promoting equitable values in our formal curriculum, but these values may not be reflected in clinical practice, where a lot of the informal and hidden curriculum play out in health professions education. Uh, so we need to be aware of the suboptimal practices that are considered the norm, which can negatively impact the ability to implement collaboration practices that they've learned. But enough about socialization, let's go on to some other relational factors. Um, so team composition is another one. And this looks at the size of a team as well as who's actually on the team. A large teams can have some more challenges, uh, for example, coordinating meetings, uh, but they also will bring more diversity of talent and skill, knowledge, experience to the table. And how well represented a profession is can also have an impact. For example, if an occupational therapist is the only representative for OT on a team, which has tons of representation from other professions, uh, the OT may feel very overwhelmed. And team roles looks at the role that someone plays on an interprofessional team, and they help define that person's responsibility and scope of practice. And clear roles can help with issues of professional boundary infringement, um, and confusion about professional boundaries can lead to role blurring, and team members could feel like they're being underutilized or they're just being asked to do everything. Not understanding another profession's role can also impact care and teamwork, um, as can not understanding each other's scopes of practice. Uh, for example, if speech-language pathology's role is not understood by other healthcare professionals, they may not refer patients to SLP. And poorly understood roles, especially when you combine this with power differentials and just a general lack of conflict management skills, can contribute to conflict on interprofessional teams. And the whole issue of leadership can be tricky here too, um, since this can shift as the patient's needs change. For example, maybe initially internal medicine um, was leading the team for what seemed like a medically pretty straightforward case, but it quickly becomes apparent that um, the patient has very complex social care needs. So social work may actually become the most appropriate team leader. How or whether or not this actually happens is influenced by issues of professional power, and hierarchy, etc. Team process is a huge area that contains a number of sub-factors. Uh, for example, communication, including verbal and nonverbal communication, synchronous versus asynchronous. Unfortunately, miscommunication errors between professions are a huge contributor to um, adverse clinical events. And while training as healthcare professionals typically covers communications in terms of communicating with patients and families, um, a reading by Hall comments that it may not focus on communicating with other professional groups. And I'm curious how this resonates with your own experience since the Hall article is a little bit older. Um, I went through nursing school after Hall came out, but not that recently. Um, so that's still pretty consistent with what my experience was like, but I don't know if this has changed um, in professional training programs. Uh, team process can also include the emotional attachment that individuals have um, with their teams. 
and trust and respect, which is often built through shared experiences over time and witnessing each other's competency. Uh, for example, physicians and nurses working together over time may develop trust and respect into contrast to more temporary workers who enter the workplace. Humor is another one which I find very interesting. Reeves talks about how it can be used to emphasize existing rules and boundaries, reinforcing power imbalances or even easing into professional tensions. Um, and it can also be a way to let off some steam in relation to the strain and stress of working together. I'll say based on my own experience, I think that sometimes humor also speaks to the trust and respect and rapport um, on the interprofessional team. For example, when I worked in obstetrics, we had one of those old ugly troll dolls from the 90s with like the big hair and the jewel on its stomach. Um, it was a troll nurse. And we had a tradition with one of the physicians where we would hide it in places to try and jump scare him. And he would do the same to us in uh, retaliation. So if we knew he was coming in to check on a laboring patient, we'd say put it in the cupboard with the sterile gloves. And then he'd get us back by hiding it in places like the med room, things like that. Um, and I wouldn't say that that was in relation to the strain or stress of working together. We just had really good rapport with him. Conflict is also mentioned here, um, which the authors point out can be good or bad, um, depending on how it's handled. And other issues related to team process can include individuals' willingness to collaborate and regular opportunities for team building and reflecting on collaborative practice as a team. Next is organizational factors. So organizational pertains to factors that affect the local organizational environment um, in which the interprofessional team is working. Um, an example of this is organizational support. Uh, for example, a hospital unit organizing interprofessional meetings. Um, so for those of you who are in leadership positions in your organizations, it's important to make sure you are providing a support and assistance to any instructors you may have. Um, so they have the time and the skill and the support to implement IPE within your workplace. Professional representation. Uh, which includes representation from professional associations, um, for example, what their policy documents say about interprofessional teamwork. And it also includes unions, um, for example, unions empowering professionals to be able to report disruptive um, behaviors without threat of retaliation. Fear of litigation can also hugely impact interprofessional teamwork. And this is especially a concern for physicians, although we are now looking more at entire teams when we're looking at patient safety issues and errors. And my friend who's a labor and delivery nurse recently shared a really great example of this, which she gave me permission to share. So on her unit, C-sections have gone up 20% in the last couple of years. And this puts them above the national average, despite the fact that they're not a major academic center that like takes on a lot of really high risk cases where you'd expect to maybe see higher rates. And this increase started following an event that has led to a lawsuit. And this whole issue has been really compounded by the fact that physicians and nurses are working from different knowledge bases when they're making decisions surrounding C-sections. So the nurses are required to update their fetal health surveillance course, but this is optional for the physicians. And this has created tension and conflict on the team because both professions are working from very different guidelines when they're interpreting um, fetal monitoring with many of the physicians working from old guidelines. And then we have the physicians who are very concerned about litigation right now. And then there's also professional power factors at play where the physician is the MRP, but the nurses disagree with the decision for a C-section. And then hierarchy also comes into play because many of the more senior nurses are comfortable raising their concerns with the physicians and discussing the tensions with them. And they have that trust and that rapport with the physicians because they've been working together for so long. But the newer employees don't have that history together, so they aren't as comfortable with speaking up when they have concerns. And this whole issue of accountability being a source of conflict also comes up within the literature. Uh, for example, physicians describing themselves as the one who's ultimately accountable for what happens to the patient, but then others on the team may also feel like everyone's accountable for their contribution to patient care. And finally, contextual, which includes factors related to broader social, political, and economic landscape in which the interprofessional team is located. Um, so each health and social care profession has its own culture, including values, beliefs, attitudes, customs, and behaviors. And through socialization, this culture is passed on to the next generation of health and social care professionals. And professional culture is the main idea that's covered in our reading by Pippa Hall this week. Uh, for example, medicine is highly competitive, traditionally involves a lot of independent learning, and medical trainees are trained to take charge and assume responsibility for decisions. So the professional culture um, that trainees are socialized into is more focused on action and outcomes. And a response article um, written to one of our readings this week also highlighted how the competitive culture of medicine can act as a trigger for interprofessional collaboration because medical trainees are in competition to outperform their peers even before they're introduced to the clinical environment. This can also make sharing leadership potentially challenging. Um, also, others may just assume that the physician is going to be the de facto leader because they're the physician and they may just expect them to take on that role. 
And this culture differs from values in other professions like social work and nursing. Social work, for example, places a great deal of emphasis on patient self-determination, and teamwork is very important in nursing culture. And different professional cultures can also influence how conflict is approached and discussed. For example, the culture of social work has more of an emphasis on interpersonal um, interactions, mindfulness, and stress awareness. And diversity on a healthcare team and across organizations can also bring a lot of benefits to our teamwork, um, like varying expertise and experiences that we can draw upon and can allow for more innovative thinking. However, differences in socialization and professional culture and social status, etc., across the different professional groups can make interprofessional work quite challenging. And gender and also social class is something we talked about in our theory module when we talked about social science um, theories. Uh, for example, the stereotype of the domineering male physician and the sweet mothering female nurse. And as was discussed in our readings this week, we can still see the effects of this in healthcare today. Uh, for example, patriarchal arrangements being reproduced in interprofessional teams. And one of our focused readings this week talks about this issue extensively in regards to female surgeons and interprofessional conflict. Uh, for example, tensions between female nurses and surgeons, and nurses enforcing their policies on female surgeons, but not male surgeons, so there is a double standard here. Uh, the study also found female surgeons were more likely to be reported for unprofessionalism by members of the interprofessional team than male surgeons who exhibited the exact same behavior. And political will can also impact interprofessional teamwork. For example, political willingness and specific policies that will impact interprofessional care. And this can also influence commitment from professional regulatory bodies and the development of initiatives to support interprofessional practice and education. And then finally, there's also a possibility of economic factors, such as cost savings due to improved communication and reducing of duplication of efforts. Another example of how economic factors could play in here, maybe not for the better, as managerial imperatives concerning patient flow that can affect different professionals' perspectives about patient readiness for discharge and creating interprofessional communication challenges. So as I insinuated earlier, um, I was part of a team that used this framework to create a workshop for identifying and addressing interprofessional issues that may be affecting care delivery. Um, we specifically did it for the intensive care unit, although realistically this could be applied to other settings, I think. And the purpose was to identify an interprofessional or patient family problem on the unit and then taking steps towards resolving it. And this was a mind map activity where the team selects an issue that they want to focus on and then they begin to identify forces that may be facilitating or restraining the problem using the PROC framework as a guiding framework. And then within the guide we've also listed some potential interventions that educators may want to consider in response. Uh, for example, simulation may work really well for relational issues, although that will depend on what the issue is. Um, and team checklists potentially could address processual issues. And I'll link the free ebook down below where we published um, this workshop, and it is on page 22. So now that we've had a in-depth exploration of many of the various factors that can influence interprofessional work, for better or for worse, let's loop back to interprofessional conflict. So at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing, so long as it's handled appropriately. So if handled appropriately, conflict can strengthen team dynamics and result in positive outcomes. Uh, for example, creative problem solving to improve patient safety. However, if they're not managed well, conflict can lead to decreased job satisfaction, decreased productivity, and increased staff turnover. For the individual, it can also have personal implications, like feeling frustrated, anxious, humiliated, feelings of self-doubt. Um, and this can also manifest physically as anxiety, burnout, insomnia, and GI distress. And conflict can combine collectively to create a culture of fear and isolation, which can create mistrust amongst team members. And this can also negatively impact patient care and safety, such as delay in care, healthcare professionals avoiding interprofessional engagement, and this can directly lead to medical errors. So how do people respond to conflict? Well, a study that explored healthcare professionals' experiences of conflict found that there were four responses to conflict. Problem solving, where the effective parties collaborate to find a solution that's satisfactory to everybody. Forcing, where one seeks to impose their opinion or they force it. Um, avoiding, so pretending that the conflict just doesn't exist. Uh, for example, a manager brushing a conflict under the rug. And in this particular study, participants said they used avoidance about 40% of the time. And then yielding, where someone just surrenders to the other person's point of view. For example, keeping their mouth shut because they feel powerless. Um, and in this study, fortunately, this was the least common. So what are some barriers to conflict resolution? So some barriers to conflict resolution include work schedules, lack of time, workload, uh, power structures, like our early examples of how trainees may not want to um, address conflict, 
lack of skill to resolve conflict, lack of motivation to address conflict, poor communication skills, avoiding or fearing conflict, fearing causing someone else emotional discomfort, and even attitudes about interprofessional collaboration. How siloed healthcare is can also be a barrier to resolving conflicts, as is how much um, team membership can change. So there can be constantly new people um, coming and going from a team in healthcare. So I want to share some first some general strategies for resolving conflict before we talk more a little more specifically about education. So I'll say um, for those of you who are in leadership positions, make sure you're accessible to your team. And when conflict is brought to you, make sure you're really listening, being non-judgmental, and being humble in your approach. On an individual level, it's important to approach conflict with open and direct communication. Um, and this includes assuming responsibility for our part in the conflict and being willing to explore different solutions. You also want to approach the situation with respect for all those involved and be humble. And I love this quote from a family physician about humility. Humility is a big thing. Just being willing to say that I don't know everything. And along with that goes a willingness to listen to both sides of the story. Another important thing is when you see hostility, sarcasm, or bullying, don't tolerate it. And one of our readings also suggested being aware of our own biases with regards to gender norms and expectations in healthcare. However, I would propose expanding this beyond just looking at gender issues to be overall engaged in critical self-reflection and be collaborative rather than confrontational when you're faced with conflict. So some strategies for educators. So avoid stereotypes and make sure your learners are learning about the different scopes of practices and responsibilities of different professions. Uh, something else you can do here that can be really useful is providing them with discourses that span beyond their own professional silo. So have them do readings from different professions. Be critical of the formal, informal, and hidden curriculums. Um, the values promoted in our formal courses may not be reflected in the clinical practice setting where a lot of the hidden curriculum plays out. And be critical of your own formal curriculum too. Some studies have suggested that interprofessional education can perpetuate um, the traditional or historically hierarchical structures of healthcare. I'd say that this even includes things like the images you're using in your learning materials. So what do they say about the different professions? Uh, for example, are you constantly showing pictures of white men in white coats and stethoscopes when you're talking about doctors? And are all your representations of nurses and social workers female? So who is and isn't being represented and how are they represented? And this all ties back in with stereotypes as well. Um, something else you can do is help students understand the different variables that can contribute to interprofessional conflict, which like I have attempted to do today. And for those of you who are educators in the workplace, regularly engage your team in team training, uh, simulations for example, uh, to provide teamwork and communication skills overall. Um, incorporate interprofessional conflict resolution into education to engage learners in the process of reflection, building self-awareness, and building those interprofessional communication and problem-solving skills. Uh, Case-based discussions are great here, as is role play. And I'll add to this that we need to be actually discussing power and conflict in our IPE, um, but it's often not covered, or it may be covered in a very subdued manner, using terminology that isn't as charged so as not to alienate physicians. Um, but when we ignore these issues, we're realistically ignoring the very problem that we're trying to address with our IPE. As Cynthia Whitehead points out in one of our readings this week, Unless hierarchies are acknowledged, discussed, and come to terms with, they will remain a significant barrier for the development of effective interprofessional programs. And I can understand why this can be uncomfortable. Um, whenever I have to talk about professional power and medical dominance, such as in this class, I do sometimes feel a little bit anxious thinking like, gee, am I going to get a bunch of like hate mail from a bunch of angry physician learners? Especially because I teach asynchronous classes, so I can't gauge your reactions and see your faces as I'm talking about this. Um, but it is important to discuss these issues, and I wouldn't be doing you or your learners any favors if I were to avoid these topics. Some authors also suggest trying to target behaviors and conflict management skills much earlier on in health professionals training, because it can be difficult to do this once these ideas are more entrenched. And something you'll see um, throughout the literature really is this idea of introducing IPE early in training. And that's not to say that this is a bulletproof answer, because realistically, you are still sending learners out into an environment that doesn't always value collaboration, as we discussed earlier. And unfortunately, IPE is a really good example of where education has been misused as this magical solution that's going to erase decades of power, um, patriarchy, and everyone is just going to be able to go forth and collaborate in perfect harmony if we could just perfect our interprofessional education. Uh, but unfortunately isn't realistic. An additional flaw with this idea of just targeting learners when they're early in their careers is we're shifting the responsibility of addressing these issues onto the next generation and hoping that a sprinkling of fresh faces with more egalitarian ideas will change the system for the better. 
But this is unrealistic due to things like informal curriculum, hidden curriculum, socialization, hierarchy, etc. Uh, not only that, but it shirks our responsibilities as educators and leaders. This isn't a problem for just the next generation to swoop in and fix. It's our problem too. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try to introduce these ideas early on, but we would be naive to think that this would change everything. So with that, I'm going to wrap things up here. I acknowledge that I have probably left you with more questions than answers. Um, and this was certainly my experience when learning about topics like this in my master's degree, uh, which is why I got into research. Uh, but hopefully this talk has left you with an appreciation for the complexities of different factors that can influence into professional work and potentially act as a barrier or contribute to conflict. A lot of the literature focuses on things like power, hierarchy, and communication skills. And while those are certainly big contributors, those aren't the only factors at play here. For example, if we aren't giving teams the time and the space and the opportunities to interact with each other, we're going to be fighting a very tough uphill battle. And while IPE is certainly a big piece of addressing a lot of the challenges that we're facing in healthcare, it's not as simple as just merely catching the next generation early in their training and teaching them more egalitarian and collaborative values. Ultimately, we're sending them out into a workplace that may undermine all of our hard work through a hidden and informal curriculum. Uh, so as educators and practitioners, you certainly have your work cut out for you, but I think it's work that is highly worth investing in. And that's all for now, folks. Um, do let me know if you have any questions about this, and I will see you all online.